Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Bijan Ahmadi, and I'm the executive director of the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy. Uh, today, uh, we're honored to have a distinguished panel of experts uh, with us to discuss Canada-China relations. Senator Wu, Dr. Paul Evans, Graham Shantz, Dr. Henry Wang, and Dr. Wen Ranjia. Uh, more than 500 people have registered for the event today. Among our audience, we have many diplomats, policymakers, think tankers, journalists, and business leaders. I thank you all for tuning in. Before I introduce our moderator and ask him to take over, let me say a few words about our institute and our work. The Institute for Peace and Diplomacy, or IPD, is a Canadian nonprofit and nonpartisan foreign policy think tank dedicated to promoting sustainable peace through diplomacy, dialogue, and constructive engagement. Prioritizing dialogue and constructive engagement is not easy, especially in light of the tensions that currently exist in Sino-Canadian relations and the complex nature of the great power rivalry between US and China, which has significant impact on our bilateral ties with China as well. But as an institute dedicated to the cause of peace, our objective with panel discussions we host, such as the one today, is to bring together experts from different backgrounds and with diverse views to discuss and debate complicated foreign policy issues of our time. We believe that through these discussions, we can develop a comprehensive understanding of each side's perspectives and aid policymakers in adopting creative and open-minded approaches in managing the strategic challenges our country Canada faces on the global stage. Our great moderator today, Dr. Wen Ran Jiang, is a member of the IPD Advisory Board and the Director of Canada-China Energy and Environment Forum. Uh, his CV is a very long one, so I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to go through all the details. But thank you, Dr. Jiang, uh, for accepting to moderate the panel today. Please go ahead; the floor is yours. And please unmute yourself first. Uh, you're still uh, mute, Van Rat. Please unmute your microphone. Okay. Thank you, Bijan. Uh for the introduction and uh, congratulations for putting together uh, this uh, important event uh, featuring a very distinguished uh, uh, panel of speakers. And I'm just being honored uh, to uh, moderate the panel. And I can see now we have uh, well over 300 people now get online, the number is increasing. So let's get to work. Um, for those who follow Canada-China relations uh, closely, uh, you all know what's going on um, in the past few years. And just for those who are joining us from Europe, uh, from Asia, from other countries, uh, who may not be following very closely on Canada-China relations, uh, I just want to let you know that since December 2018, uh, the Canadian authorities arrested Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou uh, at the request of the United States uh, for a bank fraud extradition hearings has been going on. Uh, uh, shortly after China arrested uh, two Canadians, uh, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaber, we refer them uh, as two Michaels. Uh, they are being detained ever since uh, and the bilateral relations have been uh, getting worse. And last year, the two countries were supposedly uh, to, supposed to uh, celebrate the bilateral relations at the 50 years uh, of diplomatic uh, relations, and yet uh, that did not happen. Uh, instead, there are a lot of mutual uh, accusations. And the latest development in the past few days, fast forward, um, China used very strong uh, language condemning a 58th country declaration against uh, uh, state-sponsored uh, arbitrary detentions that led uh, by Canada, uh, as well as two days ago, the Canadian Parliament, that is House of Commons, uh, passed a motion uh, labeling uh, Xinjiang's situation uh, as genocide uh, with the Liberal uh, 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 government cabinet uh, abstaining. And so we see this very tense relationship and to put all these things in perspective, uh, I'm just very honored to uh, introduce uh, one by one later uh, a panel of distinguished, distinguished uh, scholars, experts, uh, and policy makers, uh, and government and business representatives. And they have uh, uh, decades of experience of dealing with China 
and on world stage in different um, uh, uh, positions representing Canada. So to start uh, as they, with our, our opening remarks, uh, I'm honored to introduce His Honorable uh, Yuan Pao Wu, uh, the federal senator appointed in 19, uh, 2016 from British Columbia. And uh, Senator Wu has been since 2017, uh, the leader coordinating the largest uh, independent senator groups uh, in the Senate and uh, his second term uh, re-elected uh, in 2019. Uh, but prior to that, he was for many years an economist uh, 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 serving as the president of a very important think tank uh, called the Asia Pacific Foundation and done much work with Asia uh, and with China. So with that, um, Senator Wu, this floor is yours. Thank you, Wenran, and thank you, Bijan, and the IPD for organizing this event. Good evening, uh, friends and colleagues in North America. Good morning, those of you in Europe, very early in the morning, and good morning, those of you who are in Asia. Uh, um, I'm really honored to be part of this panel with, with old friends. Uh, we've known each other for many years, uh, Wenran and Graham and Henry and Paul. And we've had many discussions and many debates about Canada-China relations. But I don't think any of us would have imagined that in 2021, uh, soon after the 50th anniversary of Canada-China diplomatic relations, we would be having as fraught a discussion on Canada-China relations as we are indeed having today, in which Wenran has summarized uh, very effectively. The mood in this country is, when it comes to China, is, uh, is febrile. And the, the fever is probably highest in Ottawa, and most of all on Parliament Hill, where I work, of course. Um, we can go into some of the details of the China discussions in and around uh, Parliament Hill, but uh, this discussion uh, is increasingly difficult. And of course, uh, Wenran has already flagged the particularly uh, difficult issue of uh, genocide, which was voted on in the Parliament only a few days ago. I think what is fair to say in all of the fever that is going around the country on China is that uh, there is a deep desire for a rethinking of the Canada-China relationship. Uh, I am calling for a rethinking of Canada-China relations as well, and in fact have written an article which will be published very soon in International Journal. The question of course is uh, how and in what form this rethinking should take place. You know, with this group of old friends, uh, we've been discussing for many years and, and taking different positions on how to improve Canada-China relations. That question is a little bit quaint today in the sense that many people are not asking, how do we improve Canada-China relations? but maybe asking a question such as, should we even seek to improve Canada-China relations? Should we actually unwind Canada-China relations from where it has been in the previous five decades? The, the, the foreign policy model, if I can put it that way, of relations with a major power that can be compartmentalized to survive difficulties in one area, but allowing other aspects of the relationship to go forward, that model when it comes to China is severely being challenged today and uh, being requestioned. What though has changed to bring about this very dramatic uh, shift in the very underlying question of what to do with the Canada-China relationship. I've been reflecting a bit on this and the, the reflexive answer is Xi Jinping. 
and kind of the nature of the regime, the Communist Party regime. But I don't think that really is the answer. Xi Jinping, of course, is uh, has brought about a particular change in Chinese politics. He is uh, primus uh, inter pares in, in the Politburo. He has extended his term and may well stay for a very long time. The whole idea of collective leadership is less prominent in uh, the CCP today than it was under, you know, uh, Jiang Zemin or Hu Jintao and so on. But really, when you think about it, the regime hasn't changed. I mean, the Communist Party has been around for 70 years, and in many ways, the, the party was more brutal in the 50s and 60s uh, than it was today. And so it begs the question as to what explains the very profound shift in thinking on China, not just in Canada, but across Western democracies, and what is the nature of the rethinking of the relationship that so many people seem to be calling for. And I think the answer is not the regime as such, and it's not Xi Jinping per se. It is that China today is more prominent, it is more influential, it has a bigger impact on all of the things that matter in the world, and that this ascendancy of China has become especially pronounced since 2008. And we won't go through the history of the world since 2008, but that was the global financial crisis. And that was the turning point, I believe, in China's coming of age and coming on the stage as a serious economic power. Those of you who follow these issues know that China has accounted for 30 to 70% of all global growth essentially since that time, and, and still does. In fact, this year, well, this year will account for well over 50% of global growth because it's the only, I'm sorry, last year, 2020, because it's one of the few big countries that uh, has seen positive GDP growth. In other words, the newfound concern over China deep down it's not so much about ideology, even though a lot of the language is about, you know, the Communist Party and its abuses and so on. But uh, friends, I, I think it's about Chinese power, or it is about what the Chinese themselves used to call, this is an old phrase now, the rise of China. You remember that phrase? It was used for a brief period of time. It's not used very much today. But I think that really is at the root of why we are seeing this fresh desire to rethink the China relationship and to come up with a different model. But the flip side of China's rise and why this has caused a rethinking has to be, of course, the position of the current superpower and global hegemon which is the United States of America. And they have been in this position, this sort of unipolar position since the end of the Cold War. And my point here uh, simply is that we have to put US-China strategic rivalry uh, at the center, I believe, of discussions around Canada's relations with China and more broadly, uh, China's place in the world. This is a very big topic, and I invite others on the panel to also weigh in on it, but I want to set that context uh, for the subsequent uh, discussion. Clearly, uh, the US-China uh, strategic competition uh, has the hallmarks of great power uh, rivalry, and it has attendant risks for each side, as well as for third parties. You know, to date, the, the geopolitics of US-China competition is couched in a variety of euphemisms, decoupling or techno-nationalism or deglobalization. And some commentators sort of brush aside the possibility of serious damage to the world economy. What's decoupling after all? It's just two economies that are less interactive. What's techno-nationalism? It's just about competition and so on. And I don't doubt that there are dreamers in Beijing and in Washington, D.C., who fantasize about the rapid collapse of either side. But the more likely reality, and this is really key to our thinking 
about Can Canadian foreign policy, the more likely reality is that strategic competition between China and the United States will last decades. And as the contest deepens, the interests of each side will increasingly take precedence over the views and preferences of third countries, including Canada. The fact that we are looking at a decades long contest underscores my belief that US-China rivalry is the single biggest factor shaping bilateral relations between Ottawa and Beijing, and that the challenge we face is to find the degrees of freedom that we are allowed in navigating the rival to rivalry between the two great powers. Let me just make a few other observations on the context for what I describe as a rethinking of Canada-China relations. The first is that much of the rethinking that uh, has been going on, and I'm referring mostly to public commentary, newspaper op-eds, the occasional seminar and uh, webinar and so on. Most of this rethinking has been focused on identifying the problems in the relationship, but not so much in trying to identify the problematique. A list of problems does not define a bilateral relationship, much less a foreign policy strategy. For that matter, neither does a list of good things that may be happening between Canada and China. The question of the problematique as opposed to the problems, I think boils down to the following. What is China to us? What is China to us? Is China an adversary? Is China a competitor? Is China a partner? Is China an enemy? Now, this is not just about semantics because labels have consequences. And I'm not gonna rush Canada into coming up with a definitive label because I'm not sure we're ready to do that. But this is the process that we need to go through in the rethinking of the Canada-China relationship. Less focus on the list of problems, more attention to what the problematic is. Now, there are people who have come up with their answer to the question, what is China to us? And you know, take the Globe and Mail, for example, uh, just over a year ago in an op-ed, they've very clearly said China is a threat to, to Canada. They didn't really draw out the implications of using that label. And I'm not sure we want to uh, embrace that label, not quite yet anyway. But if we did, let's think very hard about what that means. Calling the second largest economy in the world, maybe the largest, soon to be largest, calling it a threat has consequences that go beyond saying so in an editorial or mouthing it in parliament or writing it in an academic article. Now, in my article in International Journal, I offer a way of describing the problematique, and it's only as a trial balloon to see if uh, it can be helpful. And I suggest the concept of a global neighbor now, I know some of you will be maybe even uh, shocked that I would think of China as a neighbor if you consider neighbors to be, well, neighborly, but uh, reflect a little bit more deeply about your neighborhood, and you will know that there are neighbors that you like having around the block, and there are neighbors that you don't like having around the block. But the reality is that you have to live with them, you have to find a way to get along, and to uh, differentiate uh, between different members of your community. The, the idea of China as a global neighbor underscores the reality, I believe, that Canada is in proximity with China on so many fronts and in so many places, not just in the geographic sense, but on all the issues that matter to Canada, domestically and internationally. Now, in some geographies and on some issues, our stance to the global neighbor that is China should be to build a sturdy fence. But in other areas, maybe we should have an open border and there will be yet other areas to do something in between. But it is clear that we have our territory, China has its own, 
and there will be times and instances when the governance of our territory is markedly different from that of China. Okay, uh, let me, because time is moving along and I really want to hear from the others, let me close my opening remarks with some comments about the context in which this discussion and many other discussions about China are taking place in Canada today. It is not a healthy context, my friends. And I have to say that the examples set by discussions in and around Parliament are not helpful. You know, repugnance over Chinese actions on a range of issues from arbitrary detention of Chinese Canadian citizens to the curtailment of uh, rights in Hong Kong, together with the fear of Chinese power and Chinese interference, have created an environment where discussions about China have become very divisive and prone to reflexive labeling and denunciations rather than open-minded conversation. Let's not be naive. This meeting is no exception. And I know all of my friends on the panel speaking after me will be choosing their words extremely carefully so as to not be cast as, to use the most benign phrase, a panda hugger. It is not an exaggeration to say that in Canada today, anyone who wants to offer a view that is even slightly aligned with the position of the Chinese government runs the risk of being tainted as disloyal or worse, some kind of stooge of the CCP. I speak from experience, and I have the luxury of being a Senate, a Senator in the Parliament of Canada, and with all the parliamentary privilege that comes with it. Now, it is symptomatic, this trend is symptomatic of a larger development in this country in recent years towards what I call litmus tests on Chinese issues, which seek to box individuals into neat categories, such as pro-China or anti-China. As a Chinese Canadian, I am particularly sensitive to litmus tests, which include questions such as, are you associated with the United Front Organization? Do you meet with Chinese government officials? Do you do business with a Chinese state-owned entity? Did you previously work for the Chinese government or military? Do you carry a Huawei device? Are you on WeChat? And so on. Litmus test, my friends, are a very bad way of developing foreign policy, and for that matter, a very bad way of treating human beings. I hope this session will help us steer away from simplistic formula in our rethinking of Canada-China relations and I look forward to the presentations from my fellow panelists. Back to you, Wenran. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pao. Uh, that's a very good opener. And uh, now I think majority of the people uh, joining us are online. I just want to, uh, again, tell you uh, all, thank you for coming on. Our panel structure will be each of the panelists will be uh, having a brief opener, and then we will conduct a Q&A when all the panelists uh, finish their uh, uh, opening remarks uh, together with, of course, uh, Senator Wu. So uh, next uh, in line, joining us early in the morning, just uh, barely before 8.30 in the morning in Beijing, uh, Dr. Henry Wang, Wang Guiyao. Not a stranger uh, to Canada. He uh, used to study in Canada and uh, worked actually for the Quebec government representing Quebec uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, contributing bilateral economic uh, exchanges, uh, later on returning to China, now heading a very distinguished, uh, high-ranking uh, non-government think tank uh, called Center for China and Globalization. And um, Henry, now I can see you're on your way to a whole range of days activities joining us in your car. And the video looks uh, stable, so go ahead. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Wenlan, and uh, also all the distinguished panelists and uh, Senator Bao and, uh, and all the audience online. I uh, apologize, I'm, I'm speaking from you uh, in a car because I have to uh, go to another important meeting uh, right after the, uh, the webinar. 
I think the uh, we are having this uh, the webinar really uh, timely. I I I, I see that uh, it's really we are seeing a lot of uh, things happening, a lot of changes. I, I particularly uh, felt uh, strongly and very uh, sad about uh, uh, you know uh, decline of the uh, Sino-Canadian relations. Uh, as, uh, as 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 my generation, I can vividly remember you know that it was Canada you know, when I was still a high school student that Canada was the first country among the G8. Uh, recognized the People's Republic of China in in, in early 1970s and early <laughs> probably the Nixon visit in China. So so this is really uh, we have a lot of fam fond memories of Canada. You know when I was in the uh, elementary school, the, the first foreigner I know I was it was uh, Norman Basu. You know <laughs> that was a household name in China. And uh, uh, during my university days, my only foreign uh, teacher was from Canada, from Quebec as well. So so for for our generation, actually Canada represents peaceful. Uh, you know, friendly and, of course, uh, 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 also independent. Uh, quite uh, sometimes on its international policy and things like that. So it's quite, uh, quite uh, amazing to see that uh, uh, Canada-China relation now uh, deteriorate. But also, we also see some uh, bright spot as well. For example, uh, the, the, the Canadian Chinese population has grown <laughs> largely in Canada. Uh, you know, when, when during the 1980s, when I was in uh, Canada studying. And, and later on, working SNC Laval and, and Quebec government, we see that uh, it was a very small Chinese uh, population. The Chinatown is very small. Now you see uh, there's probably two or three million uh, uh, Canadian Chinese now, and it's the highest uh, percentage of the G7 countries of uh, uh, Canadian uh, Chinese population. So, so there's a wide range of uh, 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 you know activities going up, and that helps uh, uh, Pacific trade between China and Canada, of course. Uh, we see the trade as, as, as booming uh, also for the last. I still remember in the 1990s, Jiang uh, uh, Kuajian led the team of Canada a few times to China. Uh, that was uh, uh, Canadians involved in many, many business uh, aspects of China, uh, from Three Gorges to, to Canada Wood to, uh, uh, you know, from early days of Canada Wheat. So, so now to the telecom and, and many other things. So, so I think that uh, uh, there's a huge, tremendous goodwill of Canada in China. And, and vice versa. So, so I see uh, really uh, there is uh, uh, no no point of that. Uh, and it's very unnecessary. We're getting to this uh, to the stage of today, but I don't think it's the uh, it's the end of the world. Which I still uh, 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 cautiously optimistic. Particularly, I see uh, uh, President Biden uh, now comes up now, and uh, he has actually pursued a quite a different approach than President Trump. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, he, he actually sent his greetings to the Chinese people on the Chinese New Year. And he had a two hour <laughs> a telephone call with, uh, uh, with President Xi on the eve of the Chinese New Year. And I can see that uh, so far we haven't seen any uh, sanctions from the Biden administration now. It's kind of, uh, you know, pursue a more pragmatic, more uh, realistic approach. Uh, we actually, we had a, one uh, young leader from CCG uh, actually uh, attended the uh, just finished the Munich Security Conference, where uh, all the NATO leaders and uh, President uh, uh, Biden, uh, Marcos, uh, Angela Merkel, uh, British Prime Minister, all attended, and Secretary General of UN. Uh, our Secretary General, Dr. Miao, actually uh, invited to the meeting and asked a question to the global leaders and to the uh, 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 Secretary General of UN. The, the, the challenge you are facing, you know, so, so daunting for all of us. On, 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 you know, climate change and uh, pandemic fighting and things like that. We probably should set aside a bit of a uh, ideological and uh, geopolitical uh, conflict uh, uh, that we're trying to have. Uh, so for example, I see that uh, even President uh, Biden was calling for a more, uh, you know, against the Chinese uh, uh, competition, you know, he, he calls a strategic competition. I don't see much echo there. I mean, of course I see uh, Angela Merkel said, yeah, we have to deal with China, but but also we have to work with China too. So that was really uh, a very uh, different message. But also from uh, President Marcos, he said, "Okay, U.S. is busy now on the Pacific. Uh, EU now we're going to get more uh, independent strategically. Uh, you know, we have to look after ourselves too. So let, let's work together." But he doesn't really uh, mention China. So I'm, I, you know, even for the Prime Minister, uh, I just attended uh, another conference last night, where uh, talk about ASEAN and uh, and uh, and the U.S. So you, the ASEAN country will not take a stand on either China or, or U.S., uh, as Prime Minister Li Guangyao has said. 
so so I want to uh, uh, conclude on that is uh, uh, because uh, I think we are we all have wisdom. We have such a strong tie with a student exchanges, tourism. You know, Canada actually was the uh, one of the best destinations for Chinese tourists. We have so many uh, ties with Canada, and uh, so so uh, uh, student exchange is is fast growing as well. It's really uh, uh, hate to see that uh, the situation deteriorates. I, I echo some of uh, Paul's uh, comments. I think that. Uh, uh, you know, leaders of both countries, the, uh, the elite of both countries, the policymakers of both countries, and our population could find a way to solve the issue. Maybe we should look at China a little differently. I mean, China, of course, is not perfect, it's still improving, it's still uh, working hard. But actually, as, as, as Paul mentioned, China's contributed 30, 40, uh, even last year, 50% of global GDP growth. Uh, and China has been able to lift the 800 million people out of poverty. Actually, I think uh, China could announce that, uh, that today or tomorrow uh, that they have achieved a well-to-do society uh, uh, almost by 2020. Uh, so probably, uh, you know, lifting 800 million people out of poverty, that probably, uh, it's the biggest human rights uh, development in, in the history of mankind, probably. So we probably look at it differently. I mean, also pandemic fighting, China is, uh, is doing well, and China uh, got the GDP growth of a, a, a positive 2% by World Bank last year. So, so I hope that we can work with Canada, or work with other countries, US, EU, Japan, many other countries, Australia, but also for the, uh, uh, for the uh, Madame Mon and the two Michaels, I think we, we need the wisdom uh, of both countries. Uh, I, I think that uh, 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 we really have to uh, work uh, uh, hard to, to solve that. I mean, uh, that is uh, possible. I think, all, you know, the background, the, uh, the setting, the, the 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 rhetoric of of, done, of doing that has gone. I mean, we uh, I mean we have changing of the government already in the U.S. Uh, uh, and uh, and I think you know we are more pragmatic. Even now, uh, other allies are more pragmatic. Uh, we we have to compete with China, but also we have to work with China. So I hope that we can find a solution to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, um, Henry. Uh, Thank you for your optimism. And uh, out of Beijing, you're echoing uh, some of China's bigger picture developments in the context of uh, US-China relations. Uh, uh, stay tuned, we will have uh, audience definitely will have questions for all the panels, including you, as they flow in. And so uh, let's move on to our next panel uh, opener, uh, Graham Shantz, uh, long time, um, foreign affairs uh, uh, expert on China, Asia, former ambassador to Spain, um, before taking early retirement uh, as assistant deputy uh, minister of then uh, foreign affairs and international trade, now global affairs Canada. Uh, Graham has done uh, many China related work, including uh, stationing in China. Uh, I remember the student days he used to teach in China and reading all things about Chinese and from Kangxi now to today's, I guess some Xi Jinping as well. Uh, president of CCBC, Canada China Business Council, the largest uh, representation organization representing mostly Canadian businesses, uh, large, medium, and small. Uh, Graham, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Wenron, and thanks, IPD, for uh, hosting a, a conversation in a, in a difficult time. Um, it's, uh, you're reminding me, uh, Wenran, that we've known each other for 35 years, uh, and this year is the 40th anniversary of the first time I visited China. Um, uh, but, uh, what's really quite sobering, even though I can still speak a little bit of Chinese, is that way over half of, of China's current population was born after I was there the first time. Uh, so, so it's quite, uh, quite sobering. Um, the, the strength of Canada, from my perspective, starts uh, in the institution where Senator Wu is found in, in Parliament. Uh, it's an institution that's existed for, is in the form of Canada uh, for 150 some years. I remember in Europe, uh, some of my European friends uh, would, would sometimes tease me over the youth of, of Canada. And I would, I would, depending on the country, uh, have to gently remind them that they'd gone through three constitutions in the time that we had one. 
uh, that had to correct past mistakes, adapt to new realities, uh, go through some wars, some great depressions. Uh, and it's without question uh, a strength of, of Canada that we've had to deal with uh, some of our own mistakes in the past through, uh, through parliamentary work. Uh, I mention that because when I think of foreign policy in Canada increasingly, when I, what I think of is our ability, uh, which is we would not describe ourselves as particularly perfect at it. Uh, but in the context of the 200, roughly 200 countries in the world, we're actually world class, which is growing our population through immigration. COVID-19 has put a bit of a, a damper on that for the past year, uh, but it is uh, almost unique uh, in, in the world. Uh, the CCBC as an organization has been around for almost the entire time I've been, a little longer than the time I first went to China. So about 42 years now, we're in our 43rd year. Our members are 70% are small and medium enterprises. Uh, about 20% are education institutions from UBC on the East Coast to, uh, to Cape Breton University in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, uh, high schools included. Uh, it's the, the nature of our membership has reflected uh, a change in Canada's interests uh, in China. Um, and that's an important dimension because that that people to people dimension is critical. My membership uh, includes uh, canola farmers on the prairies, uh, beef farmers in 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 terms of meat meat interests and export interests to China, education institutions I've already mentioned. Uh, so there's a, a real wide range. The hardest hit members without question are, of course, are in the tourism industry because of the, of the complete collapse of international tourism as a result of the pandemic. Uh, so, so they're the ones who are, are feeling the brunt of this. Uh, obviously, the Atlantic Canada is, has grown in terms of uh, China's growth as a, a market for uh, seafood products as well. I want to talk a little bit about, about the future. Uh, in, in particular, uh, China passes a milestone now in 2020 of reaching a GDP per capita of about $10,000. Uh, what's remarkable uh, is it reflects an Asian experience and an ability to grow that quickly compared to many other countries in the world. Singapore, South Korea, Japan all took about 18 years to go from $1,000 per capita to $10,000 per capita. China took about 18 years to go from the same. So how long did it take? And it just parenthetically, that happens to coincide with the entry into the World Trade Organization. And this gets to one of your questions, one round about what does it mean for Canadian interests? Well, for trade policy interests, it's one thing for a Singapore or South Korea to grow that quickly. South Korea, in, in that case, coming into the uh, club of the OECD. Uh, but for an uh, economy the size of China, which now will become the world's largest economy, says the World Bank, by about 2027, uh, after COVID, that's, uh, that's been pulled forward from the 2030s to about 2027. Uh, but uh, having now an economy of that size uh, means that the trade rules have to be looked at, and that will be work for policymakers in Ottawa in the years ahead, without question. Uh, the, the, the track from $10,000 GDP per capita to something higher than that, and a, a nice way of, of finding a nice dividing line is about triple, so $30,000 uh, US, uh, is, is a varied track. In the case of South Korea and Japan, uh, it took them somewhere between 20 and 30 years to go there, and, and it's difficult to go much beyond that. Singapore is a bit of an exception, but Singapore is a country, but it's a smaller, a smaller geographic space with different sets of problems, and they reached 60,000 uh, so far, and it, they got to 30,000 faster. And I only raise that because the, the demographic headwinds that are faced in China uh, are, are substantial. It's already a shrinking labor force, but still, because of the rapid growth and success of economic policymakers in terms of creating wealth, urbanization, industries that never existed before. Uh, there wasn't a super highway in China when I went there in 1981. And now you can drive from Heilongjiang down to, to uh, Sanya, I've recently learned, on, on a super highway network. Uh, but that, that infrastructure that is, has uh, led to accelerated economic growth, uh, you reach a certain limit at a certain time. 
so the demographics are going to start to change the nature of consumption in China uh, and, and the preferences and also the policy challenges for policymakers. For Canadian economic interests, uh, the, uh, much of the debate uh, it gets centered politically around exports and imports. Uh, but the truth is, from, from my time in government, uh, capital flows matter uh, tremendously much, and uh, in fact, a lot more. For Canadians who want to have a prosperous retirement, uh, the, we will need to, our pension funds will need to search growth out elsewhere. China is an obviously lo obvious location to do that as well. Um, so I guess the, the China, for China, policymakers are going to face some, some challenges as it relates to demographics. I just saw today that the marriage uh, statistics for last year, again, have plummeted. One round, we had a conversation over births as well uh, in 2020 vis-a-vis -vis 2019. Uh, but economic policymakers in China have been up to facing those sorts of challenges uh, in the past. So, so all that to say is I think uh, Canada, the CCBC's membership will turn to reflect that change in China's economy. We will, we have, we will continue to operate in the framework that the two governments provide us. At the moment, institutionally, that's the World Trade Organization in terms of market access issues. Uh, when I was in government under Prime Minister Stephen Harper, he concluded a foreign investment promotion and protection agreement uh, with China, which provides two-way protections for investors going in either direction, in important ones. Uh, the uh, CPTPP merits mentioning because that secured access for Canadian business interests, commercial interests, Canadian prosperity, jobs for Canadians in some extremely critical markets, including one I know very well uh, in, in the case of Indonesia, where I served for six years, a total of six years. Uh, so those institutions matter and the rules around uh, uh, everything from trade matter. I do want to talk a bit just briefly about environment and the climate change agenda because that is a, a high priority for Canada. As we saw yesterday in the bilateral meeting between uh, President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau, it's a high priority for the continent of North America. Uh, and it's a high priority with a net zero commitment from uh, President Xi for by 2060 in the case of China for China. So I think there's some space there that's going to need to be looked at because we have we have uh, we have knowledge, we have business interests, we have government interests in in an area that's of uh, of high importance for for Canada as well. Uh, so I think maybe I'll I'll end it there, uh, and uh, we can elaborate further one round on any Q's and A's. Thank you very much, uh, Graham, for very thoughtful bringing the economic dimensions. Uh, as you speak, representing so many Canadian businesses related to China, uh, it just remind me of a, uh, not long ago, uh, a uh, probably very angry uh, columnist saying literally, there's no, uh, nothing to be saved uh, in Canada-China relations. Uh, these people writing in the armchairs out of Ottawa and Toronto do not seem to remember many jobs depend on this relationship, um, but there are challenges and uh, you identified quite a bit on both the Chinese side and our side. Uh, but anyway, let's get back to uh, that on the environment as well to discuss further. Uh, but now to wrap up uh, the uh, panel discussion, uh, old friend, colleague, Professor Paul Evans at UBC School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. Uh, as I learned just being appointed last month at the HSBC chair, Research Chair, a uh, very honorable honorary uh, title, uh, recognizing uh, his contribution to uh, the international uh, studies, Canada's foreign policy, uh, major architecture over since 80s and 90s on the security, a track to uh, diplomacy networks for Canada to be connected with Asia, with ASEAN, a uh, visiting scholar to many places in Singapore and Harvard, across the United States, Australia, and around the world. Uh, Paul has written uh, many books on Canada-China relations. 
uh, uh, classic writing on the Harvard China specialist, John Fairbank, uh, and he's writing, as I understand, the second book. Uh, without further ado, Paul, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Wenran, and thank you to the uh, uh, Institute for Peace and Diplomacy for having me, uh, all of us, on this session today at, a, um, uh, at something of a painful moment uh, in our relationship between Canada and China. And it's so important that we're going to have space for uh, puzzling through what some of the optimistic and positive scenarios might be and um, uh, a positive problematic as well as recognizing the, the, the very difficult times we're in. And uh, Monday's vote in the House of Commons on the Xinjiang genocide resolution, to me is a significant marker in where we are and where we may be able to go in our relationship with China, as it's seen through the lens of uh, our parliamentarians and our public. Uh, 266 votes uh, uh, doesn't make for a binding resolution, but it does indicate the weight of opinion. And I think uh, Yuan Pao Wu spoke to the kinds of attitudes and feelings that are buzzing among our parliamentarians. If we add that together uh, with national opinion polls that indicate uh, only 15% favorability of Canadians' views of China. We're getting a portrait of the, the kind of domestic context in which Canadian policy is going to, uh, uh, is going to work out. And we can, uh, those, the recommendations that came out of the parliamentary committees and in that resolution may or may not translate into the actions of the government of China, uh, excuse me, the government of, uh, of Canada. There's a whole other layer uh, that is going to come in to weigh them and particularly the prescriptions. For example, uh, moving, recommending the movement of the Olympic games from uh, uh, China next year, the winter games to another location. There's, there's many recommendations in play that are not yet government policy. And those 66 abstentions, I think point to a hint that there are gonna be some interesting debates. But what those votes uh, and what those public opinion surveys tell us uh, is that how far our media uh, and our information landscape about China uh, has shifted uh, in the last uh, two to five years. <clears throat> There's the, the foundation of attitudes, of thinking and discussion is changing. The mood was captured, I think, accurately by Senator Wu in his comments about the fever level uh, of some of the discussion. Uh, but the uh, beneath it has been a transformation in the ideas that are being debated, the options that are being discussed, the images of China that are being put forward. And uh, I think that we're, we're in a very different climate uh, domestically for this discussion uh, in an era when a coalition of think tanks, NGOs, former diplomats, uh, international partners uh, are presenting a view and an approach towards China that um, uh, is significantly different than where we were five years ago. It is also irreversible. Uh, the, um, I noted with interest that after the vote came in the House, the McDonnell Laurier Institute released a statement uh, in which it says, Parliament follows MLI, McDonnell Laurier Institute's lead, uh, and then followed up with a series of recommendations uh, about Magnitsky sanctions, uh, a Huawei ban, and ending of a, quote, policy of appeasement, unquote. So that <clears throat> the uh, ideas that are being uh, discussed and articulated and are being uh, <clears throat> effectively transmitted are substantially different. And groups like IPD and others, I think are going to need to engage our China discussion in a new and more active way 
even as dangerous and risky as that can be for reasons that um, Yuen Pao Wu pointed to in the parliamentary context. This is not at the moment a healthy environment uh, for the consideration of the alternatives in China, at least <clears throat> the, the environment that we're going to need to come up with something creative. And let me, let me finish with remarks on one other aspect. And that's that the, clo the, the, the tightening of the Canadian mood, the increasing negativity of it fits into the US-Canada relationship in very interesting ways. I think that now that latitude that Yuen Pao Wu mentioned about <clears throat> how far Canada can pursue independent policies of the United States. I think with the election of the Biden government and the, the tightening of opinions inside Canada means that we are going to have less rather than more or even equal um, room to vary from an American approach. Now, um, Henry was very positive in where he sees the Biden administration going on China. And I think many of us would love to share uh, that optimism. Uh, however, when you look at the individuals in positions of authority, uh, not all of them are all that different in their basic attitude of China as a strategic competitor, and in some cases, adversary or enemy, than were people in the Trump administration, at least some of the, the, the smart ones. Uh, that we, uh, we see in the Biden administration, some very smart people. Kurt Campbell is no dove on China matters. He's not even an owl on China matters. He's hard on China. And um, even if uh, there is room in future as the studies are completed, as the Biden administration uh, finds its way to the right balance point, between strategic competition and confrontation on the one hand and uh, uh, collaboration partnership on certain kinds of issues. Uh, this, th this, the Biden administration will go that way. But in the meantime, the device that is going to be most important to Canadians is whether we are going to do uh, work with a defense of a rule-based international order via partnership with the United States and a coalition with like-minded democracies, sometimes called the Five Eyes Plus? Are we going to basically see our instrument for pushing back against China, for trying to move China in directions we wish? Do we see that instrument as coalitions of the willing, or do we genuinely want to do what, what Graham has suggested, is double down on the multilateral institutions. There's a big difference between coalition building and strengthening multilateral institutions themselves. The Canadian penchant is of course to do both, uh, depends on the circumstance and the issue. But the pressures now for coalitional alignment with the United States is going to become stronger and stronger. So to conclude, um, uh, for many years, we have talked with our Chinese friends about how we can be close to the United States, but somewhat independent of the United States. That golden formula that Zhou Enlai and others put into their understanding of dealing with China, excuse me, dealing with Canada at the time of recognition. And I think the cards right now are stacked up for us to be reduced in the amount of independence that we're going to have on a variety of fronts. Combine that uh, with uh, attitudes, negative attitudes in the country and the unlikelihood they're gonna be turned around. I don't think that the Madame Mung affair and the two Michaels, as difficult as they are, solution to them, even if that's possible, is not going to mean a turnaround. We're not just in a situation of um, uh, a storm in our relationship. We may be in the context of climate change in our relationship, and we're going to have to work very hard to keep that from happening. Uh, so with that, we can open to the floor. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you, Paul, for that very thoughtful uh, summary uh, and, and uh, echoing uh, all the others uh, from Senator Wu to Dr. Wang uh, to uh, President of CCP Xi Shenz, uh on the range of issues. So we got about good, we got a good half an hour uh, for interactions and discussions. Uh, well, listening to you, I'm already peeking into the Q&A section now. Uh, I have some questions submitted in advance and more questions are pouring in. Uh, I'm trying my best as the moderator just to redirect and summarize uh, the questions to each of our uh, panel members. I uh, just want to uh, remind you that we're into an interactive mood, things shift. So uh, the panel members, when your turn to be speaking, remember to uh, mute or unmute according to uh, the rhythm, okay? Uh, let me, I know Henry, uh, you are about to go head, heading to the next meeting, can be uh, with us longer than uh, within beyond half an hour. Let me go back to you. You put in a fairly macro holistic view of Canada-China relations as being positive. I just do not want to sugarcoat what's going on. It's not good. Paul mentioned favorable feelings among Canadian public towards China uh, is 15%. This is not the Canada or Canadian public that you, when you were living in here, let's just face the reality. The two Michaels case weighing very heavily uh, on the Canadian public, overwhelmingly, and that drives negative opinions. So I really would like you to be maybe as much frankly as possible uh, to go beyond the official uh, rhetoric that we heard very hard because people are asking, I'm reading some of these online saying, Canada may want to improve relations with China, but can China be nice as well, doing something more constructive and take some initiatives uh, onto Michael's on other things rather than everything, something up and hit Canada very hard. I, I'm just redirecting some of these sentiments and questions and you're the only member now joining us from China. We would love to have more, but what do you say? You know Canada, you have a positive feeling towards Canada and promoting bilateral relations, but this is real. The feelings are real. Two Michaels are in jail. Uh, I know China has accused Canada of being an accomplice to U.S. for Meng Wanzhou arrest, and many people in Canada are critical of that Meng Wanzhou arrest. But what about China? What China can do? Can you talk to us about that? Okay, uh, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Wendan, for, for the question and from the floor. And also, I... Uh, I, I, I'm really impressed with all the panelists. Actually, uh, you know, have time. We we, we talk about this. Uh, uh, I, I think personally, I, I think this is really uh, sad and very unfortunate that that this has happened. You know, it was really a, a surprise. You know, when we when we had actually a, a G20 summit at uh, Argentina. No, at, uh, yeah, at Argentina then. And then almost the same day, uh, uh, Madame Ong flew Vancouver and uh, got arrested. You know that was uh, that was a shot. As as uh, uh, was Paul was mentioned that you know we just celebrated 50 years of diplomatic ties. That was really out of blue. That was a huge uh, uh, huge uh, uh, setback and a huge uh, surprise to the to the uh, to the huge Chinese population. That I was never never dreamed of that. You know, first of all, this is uh, this is something we we never thought of. You know, I mean, uh, Madame Mo has been passing many other countries. Uh, European countries too. I'm sure uh, U.S. has has uh, delivered a message to all those countries. Not none of them has taken action, but then Canada did. But after all, Canada is such a good, you know, friendly country to China. So that was the first question that people don't understand, still don't understand today. Second, I mean, Iran was uh, was about you know uh, that thing what Madame Zhou was about ten years ago uh, through some HBC something. I mean, the sanction of Iran already be lifted by Obama. Uh, many Western countries did that. I mean, big companies had to deal with Iran. Nobody got arrested. It's probably in the history of mankind. You see a Fortune 500 CFO being arrested uh, in the broad daylight. I mean, uh, with, uh, and also the due procedure wasn't really 
uh, properly uh, conducted question uh, many hours uh, on the spot. Uh, finally, I mean, also uh, at that time, uh, President Biden said, OK, if you do something, we can uh, on the trade side, we can probably talk about Madame Mong uh, again. And, you know, obviously treat that as a bargaining chip. So those things really uh, are not really getting really through uh, in the Chinese mind. Of course, I, I, I also know that China has done uh, also uh, uh, some, uh, 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 you know, uh, arrest of two Michaels. That's uh, very unfortunate also. But China also has uh, followed the Chinese domestic rules and uh, guidelines and things like that. So I'm not a, a legal expert. I cannot, uh, uh, you know, comment uh, uh, extensively on that. But I can see, you know, probably both government, uh, Canada and China, has done things according to its own uh, uh, rights and uh, own uh, uh, interpretation. But, but furthermore, we, we really need to think who have started this? You know, <laughs> what, what, I mean, I was really impressed that there was uh, 200 or 220 prominent Canadian politicians have, have petitioned to solve this uh, uh, domestic. That's really uh, very uh, touching and, and moving as well. I, I, I think, you know, including to Mike's wife, uh, has pledged for, for, for solving this. So I think maybe we should really solve this, given now that uh, Biden uh, is having, a, a, you know, somewhat different. He didn't project China as a rivalry. He says a competitor. Well, it's fine, competitor. China is never afraid of competing. Uh, that was, you know, for the last four decades, China competed all, all the time too. Uh, but of course, I, f I follow the international rules, follow the WTO rule. We should, you know, do more to, do, to, to, to combine that. So what I can see, is that now is such a it's a good time. We have never been such a good time with uh, all uh, with the changing of the of the uh, of the government with the multilateralism reviving. I'm not saying President Biden is coming back. I'm saying multilateralism is coming back. You know the the collective spirit is coming back. You know WHO. You know China pledged the two million uh, to developing countries. U.S. recently pledged two billion too. That's very very uh, uh, corresponding. Very very uh, uh, you know encouraging. I mean also G7 has also uh, focus the first time, not on bashing China, but on really on find pandemic and uh, President Biden is going to hold the Earth Summit uh, on climate change. And so, so you know, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of good th signs are moving. So all of these are moving. Why Canada now passing such <laughs> very, very uh, negative uh, a bill uh, to, to talk about uh, genocide in Xinjiang? But what, what are the evidence there? You know, it, where there was no massacre, there's no anything. You know, Xinjiang population actually on the rising side for the last, uh, you know, t t 10 years. There was 2 million more Uyghurs uh, born in the last two, uh, the 10 years. And the GDP has gone up uh, hundreds of times uh, for Xinjiang. I mean, anybody who came to China would see, you know, has transformed beyond your recognition. I mean, uh, Graham just said that. I mean, I, I, I witnessed this is very well. I mean, when I first went to Canada, it was a culture shock to me. I mean, I, when I, uh, you know, take, take on the full and uh, expressway on the Toronto, it was, it was astonishing. Now China has the largest network of highway in the world, the largest speed highway in the world. So we probably should give China some recognition uh, for doing right uh, to leave to 800 million other properties. So I think, you know, uh, the paradigm shift, I'm not saying we're going to have a change, but multilateralism, I'm sure, will, has come back somehow to really come back with deregulation. Iran is get, having another talk now. Uh, uh, Iran and is talking uh, with uh, with uh, with US. US is talking, and China is interested to join that. So, are we still, you know, fighting Madame Mong uh, for doing ten years ago on something on Iran, which is first place is uh, is uh, that that is not really a soft ground. Many multinational did that. So we should have wisdom on both sides to to peacefully and friendly solve this. I'm sure that that will happen, and that, I'm sure that will be done. Okay. I'm quite confident on that. Yeah. Okay, Henry, thank you for, for those remarks. Later on, I want to come back to you because as a uh, premier of China appointed counselor to the state council, you're not a state official, but you do have channels to the top. I would like later on coming back at the end of the uh, discussion to see how our Canadian panelists would like to, uh, through you, convey uh, some of the Canadian uh, concerns, okay? So let's move on because I've seen a lot of questions coming in. Uh, some people are uh, not quite familiar with the bilateral economic picture. They either asking me uh, or uh, in this case, I guess, Graham, to look into how significant, you know, 
China to Canada in terms of jobs. And I could just uh, tell our audience off my head that, uh, yes, China is Canada's remote uh, second largest trading partner, but that remote second, nothing much in the United States, but probably is more than the entire trade volume that we have combined with Britain, with France, with Germany, uh, or with Britain and Japan, you, you do the math. Uh, Graham, can you comment on that? People just say, well, how much, how many jobs are we really relying on China? Not a big deal in comparison with some of the human rights related concerns we need to be principled. How do you respond to that? Uh, I, I would say the uh, the answer is it's the second largest economy, but it's way behind the U.S. Obviously, in importance, economically speaking, and in jobs. Um, I, I would argue that for Canadian long-term prosperity interests, and then you're usually again, uh, Wenran, you're talking about exports, which, as I mentioned before, is is extremely important. But uh, there are other important dimensions. The most importantly, the flow of people, <laughs> and that's students and tourists, and, and and absolutely the most important is immigration. And our sources are from Asia. Uh, our largest sources of immigration are from Asia. Uh, so so that's the importance of centrality, in my view, of uh, Canadian economic interests. On the export side, though, uh, my my answer to that is we are underexposed to Asia. Uh, our number one export item of goods uh, has almost always been energy, and we export 99% of our energy to one customer, the U.S. And as we've just seen uh, with uh, President Biden, uh, who canceled the Keystone XL pipeline, uh, they're going through an energy transition in the U.S. and don't believe that they need that additional capacity coming from Canada. Uh, the expansion of TMX, which of course in Canada is politi was politically controversial, but is proceeding. The uh, creation of, an, of a new LNG export facility in British Columbia uh, will allow for the first time a significant amount of energy exports of gas and of oil to support an energy transition that's going on in Asia. That's not just a China story. Uh, that's also, there's a keen interest in Japan, in Korea, a growing interest in India, elsewhere as well, and China, in having an alternate supply of energy from a reliable, politically stable supplier like Canada is. Uh, and there's, there's value to that from a Canadian interest perspective. So from, uh, for the questioners who are saying, in effect, well, you know, it's China doesn't matter that much, we can diversify elsewhere. Uh, it's true that on energy, there are other markets where we can sell, but the China market uh, is the largest import market of energy, to pick one example, and will likely be so for the foreseeable future. At the moment, in 2020, we sold about a billion dollars worth of oil into China, which is the highest ever. That represents well under 1% of China's import bill on energy. On, on other issues, uh, I would say the greatest uh, concern I would have from my own trade policy background and as an economist is the disintegration of the world, the deglobalization of the world, uh, the uh, undermining of multilateral economic instruments in particular. Uh, but really, I think uh, there's uh, those economic instruments, the Bretton Woods institutions, uh, the World Trade Organization, are equal children's in effect uh, uh, to the political institution of the United Nations, all of which are a child of, of uh, a post-World War II construct. And much of what we've talked about today fits within that context. And I would hope that uh, all nations would have the wisdom to figure that out, reinforce those instincts, and continue with that structure. It's fundamentally, in my view, in Canada's interest to do so. We've got to work our way through some pretty tough bilateral problems that we've heard discussed there. Uh, and certainly, I know from, from 26 years in public service in the foreign ministry, largely, that consular issues are, are the number one toughest issues to manage. Uh, I would also observe that in having worked for five different governments, five different prime ministers, 
that Canadians give a lot of latitude to their prime ministers to and their government, and in particular prime ministers, to solve consular problems. Uh, and uh, they give them a lot of space. Uh, so so uh, all that to say, I, I don't think there would be, from my own view, a lot of... Uh, argumentation with the, the stance that Prime Minister Trudeau's taken in terms of the priority of getting the two Michaels home as quickly as he can. So the, uh, all that to say, uh, those are some, some reactions to uh, what I would qualify as a diversification argument or just uh, you know, cut off trade. I think that risks uh, hurting Canada more than it does helping Canada. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Graham, for uh, mentioning that. I think you mentioned a number of times in your opener as well, just earlier about um, uh, the education sector as being a very important uh, kind of the China relations uh, driver. I have questions coming in, I guess, uh, two dimensions, maybe before I go to Senator Wu on an important question on Chinese Canadian communities, many of them are online, but I want to ask Paul to come in to see what the deteriorating US-China Canada-China relations may have on post-secondary or in general education institutions and and then related to that how these academic institutions other than a economic dimension as part of the industry trade but also how they can play a role uh, in uh, communicating or uh, you know improving or dealing with some of the bilateral difficulties, short term or long term. Microphone, please. Um, Graham has pointed, uh, painted a picture of an economic relationship that is fundamentally about Canadian exports to China uh, and people to people connections and education is a part of that. But let, let, let me suggest that if the problematic is shifting from China as some sort of mixed entity to China as a strategic competitor and adversary, national security considerations come in in a major way uh, that will have an effect on our technology sector, um, many of our resource development sectors here. If China is an enemy, if we are pushing back, as is happening in the United States, in a variety of sectors. Decoupling, selective decoupling, stomping down on um, uh, companies like Huawei through, uh, through chips uh, is essentially the, the instrument. We're in an era of techno-nationalism and its spin-offs in a variety of areas is going to affect us. Uh, one of those is, is universities. And right now, our science profs, uh, our, um, our researchers are under new pressures to safeguard their research, uh, to um, uh, be much more diligent about who the partners are in use of our stuff. But as the definition of what is a national security item widens so that it is not just dual use military kinds of equipment or artificial intelligence, that may have military applications, but it becomes now tied around human rights issues as well. If we start excluding partnerships, research activities because of the end use of research, well, we're, we're just starting to jump into those issues uh, the way that the Australians and the uh, Americans have, have, have been in for two years and that the British are starting to come. So that if we, if we look at our economy and our prosperity and those students coming from China that most of us still want to have here, we don't see them as unconventional information gatherers as was framed by the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We don't see those exchanges as silent serpents, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 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 hammering Canadian values. That debate is shifting. The context, American expectations, and <clears throat> excuse me, some of the rules uh, that our own people are now worried about and strong voices are saying, shut things down. Okay, Paul, <laughs> you have a sip of water. I will come back to you. Uh, 
I'm just wanting Senator Wu to actually pick up where Paul was uh, just saying, while well, he's taking some water. Uh, let me relate that, uh, uh, Paul, uh, to you. Uh, people are asking questions, what about the Chinese United Front activities in uh, Canada among the Chinese uh, Canadian communities? Uh, I know you give a speech, a number of speeches. For those who are interested, go to Senator Wu's webpage to see it. Uh, you address those issues. Uh, can you comment on the dimensions of Chinese students in Canada and Chinese communities, historical and the new immigrants, and how they are being perceived and how they are perceiving the others? It's a very complex issue. I can see people are asking those questions. Uh, on the one hand, people say, let's deal with those uh, penetration from Chinese government. Others who are asking, why are we being victimized as Chinese Canadians? Uh, can you comment on that dimension as well as related media role, as people specifically asking in portraying the whole conflict? This kind of uh, many questions coming together, but I'm taking this uh, just a continuous conversation discussion from uh, Graham, from Paul. Go ahead, um, unmute, please. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Wenran. Many, many questions indeed, and I'll try and pick up as many of, uh, of them as possible. The first thing to say is that we have to be vigilant about foreign interference. Uh, I organized an event on the Hill 18 months ago. Paul was at the event precisely to get parliamentarians to talk about the threat of foreign interference, particularly coming from China. And what we concluded uh, was that we, first of all, have to distinguish between interference and influence. Influence being something that all governments do and which may be obnoxious but is not illegal necessarily and which we counter with our own uh, our own uh, sets of information rather than trying to shut it down. But we have to be clear-eyed and tough about foreign interference. And the three markers of foreign interference that we need to look out for and resist very strongly are, first of all, corruption, secondly, collusion, and thirdly, uh, coercion. And uh, where we see one or more of these three dreaded Cs, corruption, collusion, or coercion, uh, th th these are causes for uh, strong action, and we need to make sure that our current laws have the ability to respond to such actions. And if they don't, if our current laws don't have the ability to do that, then we need to come up with a new legislation. More broadly though, on the question of, I think your question is sort of on anti-Chinese racism. If I could pick up on that topic, you know, the, the single biggest driver, contemporary driver of anti-Chinese racism is anti-China sentiment. And I know that my friends who are anti-China themselves and who are Chinese will say, well, that can't be true because I'm not pro-PRC or pro-CCP. Why would they be directed against me? Well, anti-racists don't distinguish uh, which regime you support or which part of the Taiwan Strait you may uh, reside in, or indeed, uh, which part of the overseas Chinese community you come from. And I, I don't come from the mainland myself but I am subject to the same kind of discrimination and prejudice against Chinese people in Canada. Uh, you know, the what really hit home for me was uh, the whole issue around mask diplomacy. Do you remember that? Uh, where uh, first, in the first instance, there were criticisms of Chinese community organizations, and they were all branded as United Front organizations, by the way, who mobilized in the early part of COVID, this would have been maybe January, February, to, uh, to uh, collect and to buy up PPE, masks, and so on, to ship to China, because that was uh, where the, uh, uh, the, the apex of the COVID-19 uh, cases uh, were happening. Uh, they were, of course, very quickly accused of being um, 
you know, instruments of the Chinese government uh, disloyal to Canada for diverting precious PPE to, you know, to a to a despised government and so on. Uh, and then after the China wave subsided and Canadian infections started climbing very sharply, these same organizations organized campaigns to get PPE from China to help Canadian hospitals. And so now I'm involved in a number of them. And they also were accused of the exactly the same criticism that they were part of a united front organization orchestrated by the Chinese Communist Party. And that in trying to get PPE to help Canadians, the reverse of what they did four months earlier, they were being disloyal and so on and so forth. And of course, this cuts across all kinds of uh, Chinese and non-Chinese Canadians, but it didn't matter whether you were pro-China or anti-China, this was seen as a kind of disloyal act. You know, um, I am well aware that there's huge diversity in the Chinese community on views related to China and the Chinese world, if I can put it broadly. And it is not that the community should have one voice on issues related to the PRC or Canada's relations with Beijing. You know, on the contrary, I think a diversity of opinion is a healthy and essential part in the formulation of Canadian foreign policy towards China. But it is a problem if the Chinese Canadian community is defined by its differing views on PRC, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and so on, because Chinese Canadians will then become to be, come to be seen as foreigners advocating for issues in their motherland rather than citizens who contribute to the totality of Canadian society. Not just foreign policy and China relations, but political life and business, the profession, social service, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, there's a very troubling tendency of Canadian politicians of all stripes all parties is what I mean, to view ethnic communities as vote banks and, and to treat them as important only insofar as they connect to so-called diaspora issues. That is a disservice to the true meaning of multiculturalism and to the immigrants who make up uh, multicultural uh, Canada. Let me just pause there and invite you to go back to Paul if, uh, if he's ready to continue. <laughs> yeah. Paul, that was a very uh, thoughtful uh, response to the questions. I kind of put it together in a messy way. It's complex and um, people, our audience, uh, is a so sophisticated one. They will, will continue to debate all about this. Uh, we do have a time limit. I do want to end, end the seminar by the half an hour mark. What I would like to do in the remaining four minutes is to start with... Uh, uh, Paul, and then go to Graham and go to Pao. Each of you very briefly, uh, because we have diplomats in both Beijing and Ottawa and other places, capitals, online, uh, watching uh, Canada, China. What would you, the Canadian panelists, want to want Dr. Henry Wang to convey to the Chinese authorities uh, on your wish list very quickly? Uh, that then we end up with Henry, you in return, what would you perceive to be the Chinese wish list for Canadian government that can do in terms of improving bilateral relations? I, I know it's a high uh, order, but please go ahead, Paul. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, Henry, if um, we could ask your help on, on, on many subjects because we, we need to rekindle and deepen our uh, discussion points with Chinese colleagues in universities, in the think tanks. Um, Canada has fallen uh, partly because of the bad relations a little, uh, a little behind in the multiple channels we used to have for discussion. And there would be one area that I would hope we could open up, which is going to be the rules of the road for uh, academic exchanges, research collaborations, student exchanges uh, in the context of worries. Uh, some are about intellectual property, other are about different understandings of academic freedom. Uh, and we're 
we're in a period that is is we're, we're still doing things but there are big storm clouds on the horizon and i think canada and china have an opportunity to discuss some of these matters, including particularly with our scientists, uh, in ways that may be helpful to protect and preserve that uh, the kinds of flows we want to have, even as uh, some Americans uh, and some in our own country feel that it's time to start shutting things down. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Graham? Just uh, I'll use uh, Paul's comment of flow because I think there's a blockage and we need to get the blockage out of the way, Henry, so that what will be allowed to be fl to flow in the future so that we can get the flows going back again. Uh, that's uh, my core message. I think on, on trade, so that's a bilateral message. On, the, on trade policy uh, issues, though, I think it's uh, uh, China's uh, leaders have spoken a lot about multilateralism and their commitment to open markets. And I think... The, the road from $1,000 per GDP to $10,000 GDP is a lot easier than 10 to 30. Uh, and I think uh, China's leadership is going to be required uh, for global uh, economic growth in the future as well. And that will be a challenge uh, for policymakers in, in China for some of the reforms that would be required. That's it. Oh, thank you, Graham. Uh, now, uh, Pao, uh, yeah, again, uh, go ahead. Yeah, and what I would say to Henry and your colleagues in the State Council is that you shouldn't get too excited or exercised or worried when Canadians uh, express the values that they feel very strongly about. Uh, it is part of the self uh, reflection that Canadians have, very deep self-reflection about failings that we have in our own country and in our history. Uh, and the fact that Canadians do express themselves, including through their parliamentarians, and I speak as a parliamentarian, um, should be taken in the context of uh, your own country's deep respect for the differing values of other countries. And, and the need and the respect and the uh, desire for other countries to feel free to express those values. It doesn't mean, and here I differ a little bit from Paul, the fact that so many MPs may have voted in a particular way on a motion and perhaps in the Senate as well in the weeks to come, does not, does not necessarily mean any major shift in policy. It does not have to translate into a concrete policy action. And the worst thing, the worst thing that could happen is to have a reaction from China that takes these kinds of deep felt expressions of concern uh, more seriously than they need to be taken. Thank you, uh, Paul. Now, Henry, I know you need to go. This is the very last minute before your mm -hmm. next appointment. Uh, taking all this in, let's follow up. Maybe we can do some policy recommendations. Our, our colleagues, panelists, we can join you at uh, CCG if you want to submit something to the State Council. But your turn. Uh, sum up uh, the talk and uh, send us your wish list on what uh, you perceive to be China's wish list for Canada uh, to do uh, in this very difficult time. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you, Wenzhen and uh, uh, Paul, uh, Graham, and uh, and Paul. Uh, yeah, those are, are good, uh, good messages, and uh, we we we'll, we'll draw down, and then we we'll, we we'll make our recommendation, of course, uh, as we always do. Uh, what I would like to finally say that uh, is that uh, we 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 do see a little bit of a paradigm shift, and think we ha we have to uh, live with China. China is growing um, now. China just finishes. Uh, uh, 13th five years plan. It's continued to the 14th five years plan, and then by 2035, China could double its GDP again. Uh, the target is, is setting now with two, two, uh, two, uh, two sections coming up. What I'd like to say is that I remember uh, vividly uh, uh, in the May uh, 9th, I was in Tro uh, Toronto Times Hall in 2019. I, I joined the Monk debate. I was debating uh, H.R. McMaster, the former National Security Advisor of the White House. And Michael Pierre, very uh, the leading authority of President Trump, authority on China, on whether China is going to be uh, uh, destroying the, or, or, or 
or not following international liberal order. Uh, in in a, a Thompson Hall with 3,000 audience, we, we actually uh, win the debate uh, with Kishu Mahabani together with me. And uh, I mean, the message we're giving is that we have to, we have to live with China because, uh, uh, you know, the world is the world, the history of the world is not ending. Uh, we, we probably have to see another format. But China is, uh, is, uh, is really a, 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 a positive factor to the global multilateralism, uh, you know, uh, climate change and, uh, uh, you know, a, a host of things. Of course, China is still making a, a, a lot of uh, uh, efforts. Uh, it's not perfect. It's still many rooms to improve. But finally, I would like to say uh, a message is that uh, when I was de debating with HMX Master, during his tenure, he proposed the strategic rivalry, the rivalry concept from him uh, at that time when he was a national security advisor. But now when we see President Biden's speech at the Munich Security Conference, he did not use the rivalry. He was saying strategic competitor. Competitor is okay. We can compete. I mean, that's a, a you know, neutral term. We, we don't. So I don't, I don't think that the rivalry uh, con uh, consensus is, is, is already widely spreading. As a matter of fact, the Munich Security Conference is actually uh, Angela Merkel and uh, President Macron did not agree with the rivalry. They didn't say any rivalry. They said they want to collaborate with China. So I think that's probably the, the, the message I could give to Canada that they could really collaborate with China, where, where they have the highest percentage of Canadian Chinese. We have a lot of bond ties and uh, uh, goodwill. Uh, so that uh, I recently re read the news that uh, uh, U.S. General Chamber of Commerce uh, has just released the news that uh, trade war with China will cost U.S. what percent of the GDP and uh, many, many jobs. And actually, there was another news is that uh, uh, the U.S. business, the companies, multinational, will not donate to the, to, the, to the congressman who supported Trump, cut down their donations. So we will see the business is coming back and they will have, a, a, you know, many people are coming back. So I, I think that uh, uh, I'm sure that the rational will prevail, the common sense will prevail if China uh, can get along with everybody. And, uh, and uh, we really hope that we'll, we'll continue the strong ties with Canada and we, from our think tank, we'll do our best. So thank you all very, very much. I appreciate all the comments and the suggestions. Thank you all. I have to thank leave. You. Thank, thank you, thank you, Harry. Thank you, Harry. On uh, ending on that positive note, uh, on behalf of the audience, I want to thank all the panelists, uh, members, and on behalf of the uh, uh, Institute for Peace and Diplomacy, uh, thank uh, all the audience uh, for joining us. This is quite a crowd today. Many, many of the questions submitted, uh, we cannot answer them all. And many of those we can spend the next few hours debating. We may still have to uh, keep talking. So this is the process. We'll have more events like this. So signing off, uh, thank you very much.